Okay, so my name is Scott Jones. I'm an extension agent with UAPB. My specialty is in farm pond management. So anything private waters that uh, people mm -hmm. are looking to manage either for fish or for recreation, swimming, just controlling vegetation, or just to have something pretty in the backyard, I can help out with. So my primary duty is to help out extension agents. Uh, they are kind of the boots on the ground, so to speak, for helping out landowners and uh, farmers and uh, pond owners on just how to make their property work better for them. But they get a lot of calls. They have a responsibility for their entire county, so they can't handle everybody all the time. And sometimes they get questions they just don't know the answer to. So then they go to a specialist. And I specialize in pond management stuff, so if they have something they can't answer, they bump it on up to me. And then we figure it all out together. So what we're going to talk about today are some of the biggest issues that give pond owners trouble. I could do a whole week-long workshop on how to manage a pond, though I've got an hour. So we're going to hit on the biggest issues and uh, talk about some of the do's and don'ts, quick and easy diagnoses and solutions for the most common issues that folks run into. <coughs> so the four main topics we're going to cover are when and why you should use lime in your pond, aquatic plant management, which is one of the most common issues that folks have, fish stocking and management, which is always a popular topic, and then finally, possibly the number two issue that folks have most frequently is clearing up muddy water big time issue. <coughs> Pretty easy to diagnose why it's happening. It uh, can be easy to fix, but sometimes it's not so easy to fix and we'll talk about that. Okay, so first off we'll get into when and why to lime. So when you talk about pond management, you hear a lot of folks will throw out uh, recommendations of putting in lime into your pond. And it sounds simple, but there are some details to it that you have to uh, be careful about because lime itself can be completely inert where it won't hurt fish at all and there's other limes that will kill the crap out of fish. So you have to be careful about which type you use and how much you use. And one of the benefits of applying lime to a pond is that it can enhance the chemistry of your water. And as simplified as it could be, good chemistry in your pond typically ends up in good fishing. So we want to have the water chemistry in good shape so we can have good fishing. So when to lime is Anytime that the owner wants to grow more fish than they already have and there is already a diagnosed issue with alkalinity and hardness. And we'll talk about the definition of alkalinity and hardness as we go. The why is ponds that have a low concentration of what we call alkalinity and hardness or hardness typically don't grow fish as well. Uh, fertilizers don't tend to work in these types of ponds. They're often muddy and the, the fish just don't grow well and they can even have health issues in the winter especially with catfish they suffer from a condition called winter kill where basically they have trouble regulating the ion balance in their blood during the winter and they get sick from it and you can actually lose some fish from it. Let's see. And then how is actually quite simple it's basically just putting in agricultural lime products into the pond to increase both the alkalinity and hardness but there are some things to consider during application and before application to determine how much you need and the best way to apply it. So we'll go over more of the details as we go. So before we get into what alkalinity and hardness is, when people throw out the term water quality, that is a very simple term for a really complex environment. So you're talking about all kinds of different chemical uh, processes, you've got oxygen, you've got carbon dioxide, you've got pH, you've got nitrates, you've got ammonias, you've got the alkalinity and hardness. A whole bunch of different things fall under the umbrella of water quality. Fortunately for recreational ponds, there's really only two things we really need to care about. It's alkalinity hardness. And those two parameters by themselves, if we measure those and figure out where the pond is and manage those two things, the pond is pretty much going to take care of itself. So those two main things, if we sample those, figure out where there are, treat those two items, the rest of the pond is pretty much uh, not a big deal. Now in aquaculture ponds where you're growing thousands of pounds of fish per acre, mm. oxygen becomes an issue, nitrates become an issue. But in recreational ponds, not a big deal. You're not going to be growing enough fish 99% of the time for those chemistry issues to become a problem. Okay. so. If you were only looking at one parameter of water chemistry in a pond, the first thing that I would recommend looking at is the alkalinity. And the alkalinity, to get scientific on you, it's the basically the sum of the titratable bases in water. 
and all that really combine all that really means is the bicarbonates and carbonates that are in the water that are dissolved from minerals basically limestone and parts of Arkansas have lots of limestone other parts of Arkansas like around here have very little limestone in our geology so there's not much natural titratable bases in the water so typically places like central Arkansas southern Arkansas we have very low alkalinity just naturally but we can enhance it by applying lime the what the alkalinity does what those titratable bases do is it resists it, it causes the water's pH to not fluctuate as much it basically resists change in pH during the water in the water during the day and it sounds weird because if you have uh, ever done crops or done stuff in the garden if you sample the soil in the morning it's going to be this pH if you sample the soil in the afternoon it's going to be this pH in the water it could be orders of magnitude different in just a few hours so we're dealing with a dynamic system and we need something in there to buffer that fluctuation because uh, plankton doesn't grow well when the pH is jumping around Larval fishes don't grow very well when it's jumping around, and even adult fishes don't grow as well when the pH is jumping up and down because they have to regulate their body chemistry mm -hmm. in, uh, in response to that pH jumping around. So it's, it's, it's tough on the food source, it's tough on the sport fish themselves. So having a, a, at least a suitable level of alkalinity is beneficial for the pond, especially for growing fish. So we use a threshold of about 20 milligrams per liter of alkalinity as kind of a just baseline to shoot for. And if you've got more than 20 milligrams per liter, then you're in good shape. In most parts of central and southern Arkansas, it's really common to see alkalinities of like five or six or even two or three. Super duper low. There's basically no limestone in our geology, so how are you going to get carbonates in there anyway? So most of Arkansas, especially southern parts, deal with low alkalinity, and that results in wide swings in pH, poor plankton growth, and uh, poor sport fish growth as a result. The ponds with um, alkalinity above 20 milligrams per liter tend to be a little bit more productive. They grow phytoplankton better. They tend to respond to fertilizers a little better, and generally the sport fish grow better. So having this parameter above 20 milligrams per liter typically results in a more productive pond. All right, so these are some of, I'm not going to get too in depth on uh, chemistry or charts or anything, but this is one that kind of explains why it's important to have alkalinity. And what you have in a pond in the water, you're dealing with dissolved gases all the time. And one of the big dissolved gases is carbon dioxide, and it's a weak acid. And its concentration in the water changes during the day based on the plankton and the plants and the animals that are in there using oxygen and producing CO2. Well what happens in the typical pond is in a 24-hour period you will have fluctuations of both oxygen and carbon dioxide because of all the metabolic processes that are going on and carbon dioxide since it is a weak acid anytime that it goes up or down then the pH is going to do the opposite it's going to go up or down as a response basically the inverse of what carbon dioxide is doing is what the pH is going to be doing so typically at night the phytoplankton the plants and the animals are consuming oxygen and producing CO2 which seems weird because we think of plants as producing oxygen right well, whenever they don't have sunlight, they don't photosynthesize. So they revert to aerobic respiration, just like everything else does, and they produce carbon dioxide. So in ponds that have a lot of plants or ponds that have a lot of plankton in the water, they'll produce a lot of CO2 at night. And when you've got increasing concentrations of CO2, that means that your water is becoming more acidic, the pH goes down. So in the morning, right before the sun comes up, typically the pH of the water is going to be slightly lower. And as the sun comes up and the plants start changing back to photosynthesis they start gobbling up co2 and that drives the ph the opposite direction so usually by about two or three four o'clock in the afternoon carbon dioxide is as low as it's going to be in during the day and the ph will be as high as it will be during the day and then as soon as the sun goes down we go right back the other way so those fluctuations happen on a daily basis and depending on how many animals how many plants are in the pond it could be jumping up uh, more dramatically or less dramatically so the result in pH here on our y-axis, uh, this is what happens when you have differing levels of alkalinity. So we talked about alkalinity as a buffer of pH swings, right? In our ponds that have low alkalinity, so let's say 6 or 7 milligrams per liter, which is pretty common around here, you'll get wider swings of pH during the day. It could be 
around five and a half to six in the morning and as high as 10 or 11 in the afternoon. And that is a huge difficulty. It, it's really tough for fish to handle that much of a change in pH. And in some ponds, when you start getting into the nine and a half, tens and tens and a half, that's getting to lethal ranges for a lot of fish. And I've actually dealt with that in some ponds near Pine Bluff. Last year, we had such a warm winter. They had algae growing all, all through the winter. And they were actually getting fish kills. And we couldn't figure out what it was at first because it was, it was weird. The water chemistry seemed OK. Uh, oxygen was OK. We found out that the algae was producing so much CO2 at night that it was actually jumping the, uh, or it was consuming so much uh, CO2 during the day, sorry, that it was jumping the pH to near 10. And that was what was killing the fish. And I had never seen that before. So that was a weird case for me. And it was basically because there was so much algae in there that it was doing funky stuff with the pH. But uh, ponds that have a higher level of alkalinity, 20 to 30 or 40 milligrams per liter or better, the pH just doesn't move as much. It stays more stable around the 6.5 to around 8.5 range. And fish can handle that level of pH quite easily. So minimizing the swings in pH helps to promote better productivity of the pond all around. Okay, now hardness is related to alkalinity because a lot of times, especially around here, the alkalinity and the hardness are coming from the same product, limestone. So when you look at, uh, I don't have the formula up here, but limestone is calcium carbonate. And the carbonate in calcium carbonate makes up your alkalinity. So when that rock dissolves in water, half of it contributes to alkalinity and half of it contributes to hardness, which is the, the dissolved metal ions in the water, namely calcium and magnesium, the two primary ones. So when you have limestone, which is calcium carbonate, and it dissolves, you've got hardness coming from calcium and you've got al uh, alkalinity coming from your bicarbonate. So typically whenever you measure these two, a lot of times the concentrations of both are going to be about the same. So if you've got 10 milligrams of alkalinity, you're probably going to have about 10 milligrams of hardness, roughly in that same ballpark, because it's coming from the same material. And we use about basically the same threshold for acceptable, about 20 milligrams per liter of hardness is considered acceptable. Anything lower than that, you typically have poor fish growth, poor plankton growth, uh, lots of trouble with muddy water. Basically, it, it stays muddy after it's disturbed for a long time. And again, with more than 20 milligrams per liter, the pond's just more productive, it stays cleaner, plants grow better, fish grow better, all around better. Okay, so the solution for low alkalinity the safest route is with agricultural lime. Uh, typically when we go and sample a pond, if it has low alkalinity, basically we use a blanket statement, throw two tons in there, two tons per acre. And that seems pretty unscientific, but it's okay because uh, agricultural lime, one of the cool things about it is you can't really overdose on it. You can't put too much in because if you do, it just precipitates and then you just have a blanket of white powder on the bottom of the pond and it doesn't hurt the fish as long as you're using agricultural lime. Uh, so if a pond needs it, odds are it's going to need it again eventually. So if you put too much in, it's just going to extend the period before you have to reapply. So if you put too much in, it's no big deal. Uh, so if, if the pond is low, we just use a blanket statement, two tons per acre, put it in there, see how the pond responds. If it needs more, put the same amount in. And uh, at that point, you'll know how much it needs the next time you apply. So we just do ten, two tons per acre, uh, to be safe, if you really want a precise measurement, you want to know exactly how much to put in, you can actually get a figure on that by collecting soil samples, uh, which is a, a little bit more complicated because you're dealing with a pond full of water. So you have to have cans stuck to the end of long poles and dig up soil samples. It's a pain, but it can be done. But once you do that, you can send it to the extension office and they can send it to one of the labs for soil analysis and they can determine exactly how many pounds of lime it's going to take to neutralize the acids in your soil. So you can get an exact lime recommendation by collecting soil samples. If you just want to know if the pond needs it or not, you can just collect a full water bottle, 500 milliliters or 16 ounces, whichever unit you want to use. It's just a water bottle you get anywhere. Wash it out in the pond, fill it up with water, take it to the county extension, and some of the county extension agents, they can do the measurement on the spot. If they can't, they'll mail it to me and I'll do it. It's not going to be a comprehensive analysis. I'm going to look at alkalinity and hardness, and then I'll give you a call. That's it because the other parameters are really not that important in ponds 90% of the time, so I don't even deal with them. So you don't need a fancy, comprehensive, expensive water quality analysis to determine if the pond needs lime. 
Okay. <clears throat> hardness, there are actually some more solutions to hardness than alkalinity because you can, there are some more useful sources of it. Uh, typically when we're dealing with low hardness issues, a lot of times we're dealing with muddy water. And there are three products that you can get to solve muddy water issues and they have their merits and their drawbacks. So we've already talked about the first product that can be used, agricultural lime. The cool thing about ag lime, we already talked about, it's perfectly safe. You can overdose the pond and it won't hurt anything. There's no effect to the fish. And if you put too much in, it just means you won't have to put in as much the next time or it lasts longer. The trouble is it takes a whole bunch of it to clear up muddy water. So to typically to clear a muddy pond, it generally is going to take about 4,000 pounds per acre to do it. Now you can do some tests to figure out exactly how much to put in, but we're not going to go in that. Uh, generally it's going to take about two tons to do it. Another product that you can use is calcium sulfate. So calcium is a component of hardness and it is uh, actually better at binding up the clay particles that keep ponds muddy. So you don't have to use near as much from a thousand to two thousand pounds per acre of the calcium sulfate also known as gypsum. It is also safe for fish. You don't have to worry too much about overdosing on it. Uh, you can apply it directly to the water with fish in it, no matter what the alkalinity is. And then the final product that you can use, aluminum sulfate, also known as alum, is incredibly effective at clearing out muddy water. So it can have the same effect at 150 pounds per acre as 4,000 pounds of ag lime. It grabs onto clay particles and sinks it down to the bottom quick. The drawback is that aluminum is toxic to fish and you have to have a minimum alkalinity of about 50 milligrams per liter for aluminum sulfate to be safe. And remember what I said about alkalinity and hardness usually being about the same concentration. So if you've got a hardness problem, you've probably got an alkalinity problem too. So a lot of times, if you want to go with an aluminum sulfate treatment, you have to add in another lime product to offset the, uh, the effects of the aluminum sulfate. It can be done. You just have to have something in there to offset the effects of the alum so it doesn't hurt the fish. Uh, same thing with water samples for alkalinity. Just get a, a water bottle full of water, send it to the county extension office, and they will uh, measure it for you. All right. Okay, so application of lime. It's really done best before the pond is full uh, because it's easier to get a nice even spread of the lime across the soil and it it helps a great bit if you can till it into the soil so that it gets about six or eight inches or so of action against the acids that are in the soil. And when we talk about this, we're, we're talking about water alkalinity and water hardness and talking about the water so much. When we're doing these alkalinity and hardness treatments, well, at least for alkalinity, you're not so much treating the water as you are the soil. The soil underneath the pond and the soil in the watershed feeding the pond is a bigger player in what the water actually looks like. The, the bigger effect on the chemistry than the water actually coming into it. So when you're using these uh, ag lime products, a lot of it's going to sink down to the bottom. Some of it will dissolve immediately in the water, but a lot of it's going to sink down to the bottom and work the soil. The soil is where a good bit of your uh, acid is coming from. And typically the deepest parts of the pond are where you're going to need the most because that's where lots of leaf and stick and uh, dead fish and dead algae are going to sink down to the deepest parts of the pond. And that's where a lot of decomposition goes on. And typically, a, your most acidic part of the pond is going to be the deepest section. So if there was a place to focus your lime applications, it would be in the deepest parts. Now, if the pond is already full, which is the case 90% of the time, the best option for applying to a full pond is to load the product onto a floating barge. It could be a, a deck pontoon boat. It could be a, just a, some kind of a floating apparatus, like a section of a dock that you detach and float around. And then you just use a high pressure water hose to spray that product off of the deck as you're pushing that barge around in a grid pattern around the pond. It's cumbersome, it's a pain in the butt, it takes a long time, but it's the best strategy, it's the best way to do it. A mediocre way of putting it out is if you've got access, good solid access right at the pond shore, you can have a spreader truck drive along the edge of the pond and just spread it out as far as they can shoot it into the pond. Not super effective because, like I said, most of your acid buildup is going to be in the deepest parts of the pond where that truck can't scoot it that far. If that's all you can do, that's better than nothing, but it's not great. The least effective strategy of the three is to find where the water flows into the pond and dump a big pile of lime right there. That kind of helps out the water alkalinity, 
but it doesn't do anything to your soil acidity down in the deeper parts of the pond. So best to load it onto a barge and spray it off uh, if you can at all. And if the, all you can do is spread it from the bank, that's better than nothing, but it won't help as much as it would if you got it out into the middle. Okay, so I'm just going to touch on the fertilizer because for the most part, ponds in Arkansas don't need it. So Arkansas soil is pretty fertile already. A lot of the things that prevent plankton blooms and stuff from growing, it's not how much phosphorus or how much nitrogen is in the system. It's, it's too acidic or the, the alkalinity or the hardness isn't high enough for the nutrients to be released from the mud so it can be utilized by the plants. So most of the time your pond doesn't need fertilizer, it needs a chemistry work over. Uh, but if you have an owner with a pond and they want to grow more fish and they've already dealt with the chemistry and it's just not producing as much as they would want, you can enhance the pounds per acre a pond can grow by fertilizing it. There are some side effects to it. Uh, it's not just this cure-all where you can just keep dumping fertilizer in and more fertili fertilizer equals more and more pounds. There's a threshold where you start running into problems. So uh, over-fertilizing can result in super thick blooms that we remember when we talked about the oxygen and pH fluctuations? You get too much plant matter in there, too many plants, the oxygen can go up super duper high to the point where you can actually see it bubbling off of the pond in the middle of the afternoon. Well, it's going to be consuming oxygen at that same rate at night. So by the time the sun comes up in the morning, the plants could have gobbled up all of your oxygen and all of your fish are dead. So you have to be a little careful about fertilizer. You can enhance the pounds per acre a pond can grow with fertilizer, but you have to be careful with it not to put too much in. As far as application, generally ponds are so different and each one is so unique. A lot of times you just have to put it in there and see how it works. So each pond has got a different concentration of uh, alkalinity, hardness, natural phosphorus and nitrogen in the system. And ev all these variables are just tough to predict exactly how much it's going to take. So in our MP360, we have this little table here as a guide to get you started. So the how much to apply also depends on the hardness of the water. So typically ponds with less than 20 milligrams per liter don't respond to fertilizer at all. Basically you're just dumping product into the pond and it won't do anything because it goes down to the bottom, gets stuck in the mud, and it never comes out because the, the chemistry just binds it to the mud. If you've got higher hardness, 30, 40, 50 milligrams per liter, the ponds tend to respond better so you can apply more. But uh, generally, it's not much. You're talking about a few pounds per acre. And a, an acre is about the size of the playing surface of a football field. And you're talking a couple of pounds of fertilizer. That's, that's not much. So it's really easy to over-fertilize, and a lot of times you don't need it. With fertilizer, uh, the primary uh, nutrient that you need to have in an aquatic fertilizer is phosphorus because that's the main limiting reagent or main uh, limiting nutrient in water. You typically don't need much nitrogen and you certainly don't need any potassium but uh, most of these aquatic fertilizers are going to be high in phosphorus a little bit of nitrogen and very little if all potassium okay moving into aquatic plant management <clears throat> so what is a weed anybody got an answer for what's a weed and we're not talking about cannabis <laughs> well how does a plant become a weed Basically, it's growing where it's not wanted. You could have a beautiful flower, and if it's growing in the wrong spot and you don't want it there, it's become a weed. So a lot of the aquatic plants that are in ponds in Arkansas, they are actually beneficial plants, but they might be growing too abundant, or they might be in parts of the pond that the owner doesn't want. And if they're where they're not supposed to be, they are weeds, and they need to be dealt with. So <clears throat> when to control aquatic vegetation, it's really a year-long process. Uh, the best time to apply your treatments tends to be in the spring, late spring to early summer when the plants are starting to grow at their most rapid rate. But you can do this, you can uh, observe plants any time of year. I mean, last year it stayed warm all winter and there were still good crops of algae growing in a lot of ponds in January because it never got cold enough to kill them all. You can see in January, hmm, I've got algae left, that's probably going to be a real big problem in about four months go ahead and buy up your product and get ready to treat it whenever it starts to rapidly grow because the most effective time to treat plants with herbicides especially is when they're rapidly growing so right when they start to grow real quick is when the best time to hit them with herbicides all right uh, 
another note about plants, and Dr. Spurgeon mentioned it in his last talk, some cover is beneficial. And exactly how much percentage of coverage is best for a pond or a lake or a reservoir or whatever, it's hard to pin down. But anywhere from about 20 to 40 percent coverage in some kind of cover, either from vegetation or from brush piles or log jams or whatever, tends to result in better fish communities, more successful fisheries, when you have somewhere between 20 to 40 percent or so coverage of some type of cover. It's really tough to keep plants in ponds in that little bracket because they, ponds tend to have lots of shallow area, so those plants spread really quickly. It's hard to keep them in that little area. So it, it's really tough to have plants without them getting out of control in, plants, in ponds. So we typically have lots of herbicide and uh, treatment strategies for them because they cause so much trouble. Okay, so steps for treating plants. The number one step is to correctly identify it. Because there are lots of herbicides, not lots, there are, half a do or there are a dozen or so herbicides for aquatic use. Uh, and not every herbicide kills every plant. So you have to figure out exactly what species that plant is. And the county extension agents can help you with that. There are some online resources I'll mention that can help you with that. Next is select the control technique that's appropriate. If you are okay with using herbicides, you pick which herbicide is appropriate for the situation. If you're working with a homeowner's association and they don't want herbicides in their lake, then you might have to go to a physical control or a mechanical control or biological controls. There's lots of options uh, for several plants. Then follow the application instructions that are provided with the product labels, especially with herbicides. They come with really detailed instructions on how to use them. And then Finally, observe the results, see how it works, and see if you need to retreat. Because a lot of herbicides work very quickly, but they do partial control. Or they only kill parts of the plant and it's going to regrow and you have to treat it again later. So it's important to make sure that it worked and be ready for re reapplication somewhere down the line if necessary. For identifying the plants, there are a couple of online resources that are really handy. One is called Aqua Plant. So if you hop into Google and you type in the search aqua plant, it's going to come right up. It's uh, run by Texas A&M's Extension Service, so they're in a different state, but a lot of the plants that they list on that website are also in Arkansas. So you can typically find what plant is causing an issue in your pond through that website. The Unis University of Florida Center for Aquatic Invasive Plants is also another useful one. I don't find this one quite as user friendly as Aquaplant, but it has great information in it as well. So if you can't find the plant you're looking for in Aquaplant, you can hop over to Florida's uh, website and see if they've got it. And then also the county extension agents, they get trained every year on aquatic plant identification and management. So you can send a picture, it's really easy, it's 2018. Pull a clump of that plant out of your pond, snap a picture of it, send it to the county agent, and a lot of times they can identify it right on the spot, and you've got a text message back right then, it's this, and then you can go find what, uh, what treatment is necessary for it. And if they can't figure out it, it bumps on up the chain to, to me or some of the other specialists, and we can figure it out for you. Okay, so we're going to skip through some of these uh, fairly quickly, different types of treatments, and... Each treatment has its merits, some good, some bad, and each treatment has limitations. A lot of times with good pond management, aquatic plant management in ponds, it takes a combination of management strategies. So you might use a combination of herbicide to knock it back and then a biological control to keep it back. You might use mechanical control to treat a small area and then a <coughs> biological control to try to treat the large area. So combinations of these different types of treatments are usually more effective than one by themselves. So physical control basically means changing the environment of the water that the plant is growing in, either by coloring it. You can put aquatic dyes that are basically food coloring into the water and change the color of the water, make it more turbid. Basically, that blocks sunlight from reaching the plants. A lot of times, these aquatic dyes do not kill the plant. They're not, they're not shading the pond enough to completely suffocate the plant, but it's enough to slow down the growth. And maybe you will only have plants growing two to three feet deep rather than six or seven feet deep and covering up the whole pond. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Typically, this is going to be for submerged plants, so plants that root from the bottom and grow up. This is, the dyes are going to be more effective for those. Uh, it will help with planktonic algaes and filamentous algaes too, because filamentous algaes are probably the number one 
nuisance aquatic plant, but they begin growing on the bottom. So if you can shade the bottom, you won't have as much filamentous algae to worry about. Also, you could just change the depth of the water. So if you have a water control structure on the pond, you can raise it or lower it to either drown some plants or to expose them to either freezing during the winter or drying during the summer. Uh, cattails, for example, are a, they're a really hardy, robust plant that grows around the outside of ponds, and they're, they're kind of tough. Yeah. But you can actually drown those suckers by cutting them with a weed trimmer and then raising the pond over a foot, and as long as the stocks are covered up with water, they'll drown. And you can, uh, you can treat them without actually putting any chemicals in the pond by just drowning. Um, let's see. Now, drawdowns and raising the water up, that's kind of a tricky uh, deal. It's not a blanket, this is going to cure all species, because some plant species will actually be made worse by drawing it down. So they can just continue growing out on the mud. Others, they're stuck where they're at, and they'll just uh, basically dry out and die. So you need to, again, identify what plant it is first and then consult one of the specialists to see if a drawdown or raising the water up is going to be appropriate for that plant. Mechanical control is basically you're using hand power, tools, or machines to remove plants. And advantages, a lot of times it's cheap, so you're using hand tools. I mean, you're talking 20, 30, or 40 bucks maybe for a really nice tool. Uh, lots of physical labor, but as far as cost goes, your cost is labor for the most part. Um, so places that do not allow chemicals or they don't want non-native fish in their streams or in their systems, this might be the only option available. Uh, good things is you, you basically can clear out small areas pretty effectively. It's impossible to clear out more than half an acre, an acre or so by yourself. Uh, there are mechanical harvesters, big heavy duty machines that can go and crop this stuff off, but they're expensive to operate, they're expensive to purchase, um, but they can be done. And one of the issues with mechanical harvesting is a lot of times what you're doing is you're, it's hard to pull the roots up out of mud whenever you're already underwater. So a lot of times you're just breaking those plants off at some point. Those plants that are still rooted are gonna regrow and there are other plants, for example, hydrilla, that if you break it into fragments and the fragments spread off, each one of those little fragments can start a new plant. So you could easily turn a half acre problem into a 10 acre problem by trying to remove them like this. So it's, it's got its merits for small areas, so you could clean out like a fishing pier or a boat dock or a, uh, a small swimming area mechanically, but that's about the extent of what you can do with mechanical control. Biological control just means you're using animals to do the work for you. Benefits of this, uh, biological controls tend to be one of the most cost-effective strategies, but they also tend to be specific to certain species of plants and typically it takes a long time for them to get things under control. So grass carp are one of the most common, commonly recommended species. Uh, one of the drawbacks is they don't eat everything. So there are about four or five, six or so species that they will control very well. Two or three species that yeah, they'll kind of eat if they're starving to death, and then a whole bunch of other species they won't touch. So you have to, again, identify your species correctly. Uh, typically they are, uh, it takes them about two years to get things under control. So if a pond already has a problem, putting these grass carp in there, you won't see much effect in the first year. But after the second year, you'll start noticing, oh, my pond's a lot cleaner than it used to be. It takes them a while to get things under control. So this is another example of combining treatments is often a good strategy. So you might hit the plants with a herbicide the first year and then have the grass carp in there to keep them away in the following years. And typically they've got a lifespan, an effective, control lifespan of about five to seven years. After about six or seven years, it's time to start restocking them. Uh, they don't live forever, so they need to be restocked. Tilapia are actually really good at controlling filamentous algae, which is one of the biggest nuisance plants in Arkansas. One of the troubles is they are a tropical fish and they will die below 55 degrees. And pretty much all of Arkansas, unless you've got a hot spring, is gonna get into the 30s, into the 40s in the winter. So the tilapia will get whacked in the winter. So they're a, a restocking uh, deal if you want to use those. They're excellent uh, supplemental forage for largemouth bass because they spawn quite a bit so it's, uh, it can be good for the fishery in more than one way. Trouble is they are absolutely non-native and they can be invasive and Arkansas Game of Fish is kind of weary about them being uh, released but they won't come out and say they're straight up illegal so we're still free to use them. 
Goldfish are actually pretty good at controlling duckweed, uh, the little floating green plants on the surface. Trouble is, most goldfish are like that big and they're brightly colored and they're really easy for largemouth bass to gobble up. So goldfish are great for like uh, watering tanks or maybe bird feeders or small garden ponds that don't have any predators in them. They're pretty and they can keep duckweed away. So they're a, they're a useful strategy when there are not big predators around. And then final, finally, chemical treatments, that's basically using herbicides to kill plants. Some of the advantages is that they, uh, many of them work very quickly. There's no labor. You basically paddle out in the boat and spread it as you go in most cases. Uh, you can use a little spray rig, uh, ride a four-wheeler around the edge of a pond, and you don't even have to get up. You can ride around the pond and spray it from the seat of your ATV. Uh, certain herbicides will treat an entire pond. Others will do spot treatments. Some of the disadvantages is some of these products can be outrageously expensive. Um, they don't sell a whole lot of aquatic herbicides and it costs a lot of money to get them registered so they have to make their money back. So the aquatic herbicides can be quite expensive. Not all of them are outrageously expensive, but there are a few newer products that are still just dumb expensive. Uh, some of the herbicides, they work quickly, but it's kind of temporary. So they'll, they might kill the plant within a couple of days, but then it grows back within a few weeks and you might have to do retreatment. And then finally, with all herbicides, you have to follow the instructions, not only to make sure that it works right, but to make sure that you don't hurt your fish. The chemicals in the herbicides, in the aquatic herbicides, have been tested to where you just about can't kill the fish directly with the chemicals in the herbicides. But what you can absolutely do is kill too many plants at once and gobble up all the oxygen in the pond, and that will kill the mess out of your fish real quick. So you have to be careful about how much you put in. Okay, so with herbicides, the instructions on their label are incredibly detailed. Uh, that's useful, and it's also the law. So if you, as long as you follow the instructions that are printed on the label, then the product will work. It won't kill your fish. It won't kill your plants and your animals outside the pond. Um, and if you do not use it in accordance with the, with the label, technically you're breaking the law. And if something were to happen where your treated water gets out of your pond and screws up a local stream or something, you could be liable for the damages. So as long as you're following the instructions, you're perfectly safe. All right. There are two main types of herbicides, contact and systemic. Contact herbicides are fast acting. As soon as they hit the plant, they start to break it down and destroy it. And typically within a few hours to a few days, maybe a week or so, contact herbicides have done their work and they've killed the plant or the part of the plant that they've touched. Uh, trouble is they don't work very well for submerged plants. You have to get good coverage of the plant for them to work all the way. Uh, and they work so quickly that if you treat a large amount of the pond at once, <coughs> you can create too much de decomposing plant in the pond and uh, run into oxygen problems. So you have to be careful about how much of the pond you treat with contact herbicides. With systemic herbicides, they work a lot slower. Uh, typically, you're seeing effect of the plant within a week or two, maybe three, and some of them might take a month or two before you actually see the plant dying. That seems like, why would you even bother? But one of the benefits of it is a lot of the systemic herbicides, they're pond-wide treatments. So you can treat the entire pond at once. The plants break down slowly, so you don't have the big oxygen consumption all at once. They're generally safer to use, but they do take longer to work. So we talked about this already. It's usually a good idea to combine treatments. So you might do a herbicide to knock the plants back initially, and then a biological control to keep them away for the next coming years. Okay, so specifics on grass carp. They're kind of thrown out as this cure-all, but they really are not. They're quite picky about what they eat. In our fish stocking recommendations, typically we were talking about like five fish per acre as a preventative measure, but you could go as low as two or three per acre. Um, in ponds that have a really big problem, they might jump up to 20 fish per acre, but that's usually not desirable because what will end up happening if you've got a really high stocking rate of them, within two or three years, the pond will be completely wiped out of vegetation and there'll be nothing for the larval fish to hang out in. There'll be nothing for the invertebrates to eat on and hang out in. It's not usually beneficial in the long run for the lake or the pond to get overloaded with grass carp. So it's good to be conservative with these guys. All right. These are the species that they typically will eat very well. Uh, ones that we commonly run into, chara, olodia, uh, igeria sometimes. Hydrilla in some cases, we don't have a whole lot of ponds that end up with hydrilla. 
but one we do get a lot are the naiads, and the grass carp do well with southern naiad is one of the most common ones. Uh, fanwort occasionally, bladderwort's typically not a problem, but these guys, they will eat and they will control it at low stocking rates. These species, Nitella, Coontail, and some of the pond weeds, they will control, but they don't love it. So typically with these, you have to kind of overstock just to get the same measure of control. But uh, they will eat these, they just don't love them. Okay, moving on to fish stocking. What and how many? So this is coming at you from a perspective of you just rest or you've just rebuilt a pond or you're building a pond from scratch, which is usually not what we're dealing with. We're typically dealing with somebody that just bought a property. I got a pond. I don't know what the heck's in it. What should I put in it? Well, you got to figure out what's in it first before you can start recommending what to stock. But if you've got a situation where you've just had a pond rebuilt and it's totally cleaned out or you've just got a new pond and you're going to stock it, these species are safe bets. And we go by safe bets because they've been demonstrated not only anecdotally but scientifically. We've got data going back nearly 60 or 70 years now showing that this combination of fish works in southern ponds. Now that's not to say that other species combinations don't, but whenever Extension is recommending stuff we tend to try to recommend surefire things. We don't, we don't uh, want to tell the general public maybes. We want surefire bets. So uh, bluegill are typically the primary food source of one of the most common sport fish in the south, the largemouth bass. Radar sunfish are another kind of sort of like a bluegill. They're the same kind of body shape, same kind of body style. They kind of look the same too, but they eat a totally different food source. They eat snails. So who cares about snails, right? I, I like snails, right? The trouble with snails in ponds is they are an intermediate host for a parasitic grub that will often manifest in the fillets of your sport fish and your catfish. So they're not necessarily bad to eat, but when you cut one open and you look at the fillets and there's grubs in it, I'm not eating that. So it, it's kind of a waste of your food. Uh, you actually can cook those fillets as long as you, you know, get the regular cooking temperature. It's safe, but it looks really gross and I wouldn't want to eat it anyway. <laughs> well, if you stock these red air sunfish that eat these intermediate hosts for these uh, parasitic grubs, if you break the life cycle of that grub, they're gone. They can't complete the life cycle. They can't reproduce. Eventually, they will completely uh, be removed from the pond. So we generally recommend a low stocking rate of these red air sunfish to make sure that those snails are cropped off and eliminated so that you don't have grubs in your sport fish. Uh, catfish and largemouth bass, they're typically considered your sport fish, the ones that you you take the kids out and, and you catch with rod and reel. Um, fathead minnows and golden shiners are kind of lumped together. They are a, a small fish, typically no bigger than about like that. In the presence of largemouth bass, they don't last very long. They get gobbled up. They, they basically provide a supplemental forage, something else for the fish to eat to give the poor bluegills a break because they get gobbled up quite a bit. The good thing about the bluegills is they reproduce as soon as the summer starts and they reproduce several times during the year. So they make lots and lots of babies. But in some ponds, if you've got lots of bass, it's beneficial to have some minnows in there too to give the bluegills a break. And then grass carp are a safe bet. Two to three per acre is a, a good conservative number. We say five in the MP360, but you can probably get away with two or three alone, especially in a smaller pond. Okay, species that are risky. These are species that technically will work, but they might not. So we, like I said, we try to bet on uh, safe bets. Crappie are extremely popular, and we get lots of questions about getting crappie into ponds. You can make them work in very specific situations, either by overloading the pond with largemouth bass, or by using a uh, sterile variety of crappie, either a triploid or a hybrid that has been made effectively sterile so that they don't reproduce. The problem with crappie is they have really unpredictable and prolific reproduction whenever they do reproduce. So without getting too technical, in the, in the long run, within a few years, all that's left of the crappie are teeny tiny little suckers that you can't even catch with hook and line. So it's, uh, you have to have the pond set up for crappie for it to work right. Uh, threadfin and gizzard shad. Threadfin are actually an excellent forage fish for bass, and so are gizzards. But the problem is gizzard shads can get over a foot long. Threadfins only get about eight inches long at best. So gizzard shad, they are a, uh, a herbivorous fish. They're a planktivorous fish. They filter out the water, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal because there's not a whole lot of fish that we recommend stocking that are filter feeders. What becomes a problem is these gizzard shad can get so large that eventually you end up with a population of filter feeding fish that are too big to be eaten. 
and they're filtering the base of your pond's food chain. They're eating up the plankton that feeds your invertebrates, that feeds your baby fishes. And it can actually cause a collapse of the fishery by letting these big gizzard shad overpopulate. So the trouble is gizzard shad and threadfin shad look darn near identical. If you hold one next to each other, if you don't know what to look at, you'd say it's the same fish. They've got slightly different mouth shapes, and the gizzards can get much bigger. But if you've got two of the same sides, most folks can't tell the difference. And they often school together. So they're risky because often when you go and catch threadfin, there are some gizzards mixed in. Other sport fish like uh, smallmouth bass, there are parts of Arkansas that naturally sustain uh, smallmouth bass. And some of the bigger reservoirs and some of the cool uh, river systems, you can have naturally reproducing lar uh, smallmouth bass. You can make them work in ponds, but typically you need rocky substrates. You need deeper, clearer water that has good oxygen in it. And typically in Arkansas, we have shallow, kind of sort of muddy, warm ponds that the smallmouth bass just don't handle very well. So species to keep out. Uh, the big ones are green sunfish, bullhead catfish, common carp, talked about gizzard shads already, and wild fish. Basically what the green sunfish do is they eat the same food that your bluegills and your bass eat. So they're actually taking food away from both of your uh, important fish, your, your primary prey item and your primary sport fish. They're fun to catch. They're a little bit more difficult to catch than uh, bluegills, a little bit more difficult to catch than largemouth, but uh, they have a, a, a knack for overpopulating and kind of taking food away from your desirable fish. Bullhead and common carp are problematic because they are both known for creating muddy water and keeping water muddy because they're both kind of, especially the common carp, they feed by rooting up mud looking for uh, invertebrates, looking for uh, critters and organic muck down at the bottom. Just the way they feed stirs up mud and if you have low hardness your pond will stay muddy forever. If you have too many fish you can have good hardness and your pond will still stay muddy because they keep kicking it up. So these two dudes are big time to keep out uh, for muddy issues. Gizzard chads because they get too big and they'll crash the uh, food chain. Wild fish, this is kind of iffy. What I'm talking about with wild fish is if you've got a pond where you've spent several hundred dollars or thousands of dollars on hatchery raised fish and you stocked them into this pond, it's possible that if you went and caught a fish out of the Arkansas River or a fish out of Lake DeGray and stocked it into your pond, they might have a strain of a pathogen that your hatchery fish haven't seen. Eh. Eh. I don't know about that, but that's something that you want to be careful about. If you spent a whole bunch of money on your hatchery fish, you might want to be wary about bringing in fish from an outside source that's not from a, a certified fish farm so that you don't introduce unwanted pathogens. Okay, stocking rates. Uh, people put a lot of emphasis in the stocking rates, but honestly, stocking rates are just ballpark figures to get things started in the right direction. They're not as important as people knock them up to be. As long as you get the balances in order uh, right from the beginning, within a couple of years, how much those fish reproduce has a lot more to do with how the pond uh, fishery goes than how many you put in it at the first moment. So for our stocking rates that we've got in our MP360 and what we put around in our workshops and our in-services is this one here. And basically what we've got going on here on the upper uh, row are the species in our general stocking recommendation. You've got your largemouth, your bluegills, your red ears, catfish, grass carp, and minnows. And then on your uh, column on the left side are the combinations you could choose. So if you just wanted to put in bluegill and bass, then you could just put in 50 largemouth and 500 bluegills, some grass carp, and just forget the catfish and the red ears if you wanted to. If you want to put all of them in, then these are the numbers that you would put in. And these numbers are based on fingerlings per acre. So we're talking about little fish like that big stocked into the pond and they'll grow bigger uh, over time. The mo really the exact number of fish to put in per acre is not as important as making sure the ratios are right, especially for your largemouth and your bluegills. Typically we recommend about a 10 to 1 ratio of bluegills to largemouth bass no matter how many you put in. Uh, so that there are enough of those bluegills, one, to provide enough food for the bass, but also to have enough individuals that they can replace themselves from getting gobbled up. So a 10 to 1 ratio on those dudes is what we recommend. And if you do stock red ears, we just kind of lump those guys in with the bluegills because they're kind of the same body size, kind of the same lifestyle. Uh, so just kind of lump those in and you end up with a 10 to 1 ratio of those guys to the largemouth bass. 
With channel catfish, they typically don't reproduce very well in most ponds. You can, ha you can have habitat in there so that they do reproduce, but in most southern ponds, they don't do it very well. So you can kind of treat them as like a put and take fishery. You put 100 catfish in, and every time you catch one out, that's one less catfish, and there won't be any more. So as you take them out, just kind of keep record in a fishing log. And when you, you know you've taken out 60 catfish, there's probably not many left, and you probably didn't get 100% survival, so you're probably getting close to restock time. Now this is a concept that's hard to get folks to believe, that ponds need to be harvested. Uh, most of the time when you've got a pond owner, they will catch fish and immediately release it, just religiously. They won't keep any of their fish. Believe it or not, that can be harmful to the fishery. Um, it's the same thing with like uh, trophy deer management. You ever heard of the term of thinning the herd? Uh, talking about elk in Yellowstone, they ate all the plants that they could reach and it was just a moonscape <laughs> about five or six feet off the ground. <clears throat> you have to thin the herd so that there's enough food for each individual to eat. These fish will continue reproducing until they reach the pond's carrying capacity. And if you've got everything right as, as much as the pond can possibly support, each individual is not going to be as big as it could be. So if you thin the herd to where you've got plenty food for each fish, then each one of them will grow faster and they'll grow bigger. Typically with largemouth bass, uh, most ponds can support 10 to 15 pounds per acre of harvest per year, which is not a whole lot. If you've got uh, half pound fish, you're talking 20 fish per acre. If you've got a three pound fish, well, you, you catch five of them and you've re reached your quota. So typically we recommend taking the fish out of the smaller size group. So catch a lot of little ones. You take out more mouths so the ones that remain grow bigger and faster. For bluegills, 40, 50, 40 to 50 pounds per acre. And we're talking about a fish that typically doesn't get that big. It's like, that's outrageous. They reproduce a lot, they can handle it. So typically uh, you can get away with a lot of bluegill harvest. And with channel catfish, they're a put and take fishery. So it's not so much uh, thinning the herd as you're, you're taking out the herd and it's not replenishing itself. So you just have to treat it as a put and take. Okay, I talked about crappie a little bit already. You can make crappie work if you've got a really high largemouth bass population. Uh, or if you use a sterile crappie, something that doesn't reproduce, uh, a hybrid or a triploid. And we're shooting through these because I'm running out of time and I wanted to get to some of the other topics. Uh, there is a timing strategy for stocking your fish as well. You don't just dump all the species in all at once. Uh, typically, you will stock your forage fish first. You want your forage, forage fish to get established in the pond hopefully get a first spawn going before the largemouth get big enough to eat them. So it, let's say that we've got a pond that gets, the construction is finished in late summer. So most pond construction is gonna be in the summer because it's too wet the rest of the year to do it. So the pond fills up in the late summer, the fall starts uh, bringing in the rain. You can stock the bluegills and the red ears and your minnows if you want to stock them in the fall. And then the following spring, you stock your largemouth. That allows the bluegills a winter to get acclimated to the pond, uh, hopefully get big enough to maybe have their first spawn before the largemouth get in there. And then if they get their first spawn off, then the largemouth will have a fresh batch of baby bluegill to eat as soon as they're put in. Uh, crappie, if you want to do crappie, they need to, you need to hold off on crappie until the bass have been in the pond for at least a year. So the bass population is established and ready to handle the crappie before you put them in. So these other species, hybrid sunfish, catfish, they are kind of in the same category. They're a put and take fishery because they don't reproduce much. You can put these guys in any time of the year as long as it's not the super hot, hot part of the summer. Because there are very few fish that handle well the transportation from the fish farm, loading them in the truck, driving an hour over the highway and dumping them in the pond. When it's really hot, they don't handle that very well. So stock any time when it's not the summer and you'll be, usually you'll be fine. And just like with uh, tempering your aquarium fish at the house, you need to give time for those fish to acclimate to the pond environment where you're stocking them. So if you're buying a big enough order from a fish farm, typically the truck driver will be trained in acclimating those fish to the water uh, of your pond from the truck. If you're buying a small batch of fish and they give you a big bag and you carry it home, you'll want to sit that bag in the water for a while and allow the temperatures to equalize. So it might be half an hour to an hour or so, <coughs> and uh, then release them after they've had time to kind of equalize with the water temperature. Another thing you want to be careful about is 
if you have a pond that already has fish in it, not stocking fish that are too small. So if you've got an established largemouth bass population in a pond and you stock a bunch of four or five inch fish, well, a lot of times you've just fed the bass. You didn't really oh. stock your pond. Wow. And this is especially a big issue with like grass carp. So if you've got a vegetation issue and you're wanting to do biological controls with a grass carp, you really need to go with a six or eight inch fish and that's, those get kind of expensive. They might be seven or eight dollars a pop. But if you stock one of the smaller ones, they grass carp are shaped just like a hot dog. They go down real easy for a largemouth bass. So you want to get a bigger fish so that they'll avoid predation. To overly simplify uh, assessing the fishery, you can do it on your own with a seine net and a fishing pole in a summer. Um, you don't have to hire a, a management company with a shock boat. You don't have to have a specialist come out and do it. You can catch fish with a rod and reel and then catch some fish with a net in the late spring to see what your reproduction is doing and get a pretty good idea. There's good explanation of that in the MP360. There is a table in your MP360 that's got a whole bunch of data in it. It'll tell you, based on your fishing and your seining, whether or not the pond is considered balanced, if it's out of balance, and then what to do with it after you've determined what the balance is. So if you're trying to rehabilitate a pond and you're having trouble with it, with corrective harvest or corrective stocking, generally want to give it a year or two to see if you can get things going in the right direction. But if stuff is just not working, if you've got leaks in the dam, if you've got water that's less than five feet deep, and especially if the average deep depth is less than three feet, it's not even worth bothering with. Uh, if you've got nuisance species that are overpopulating the pond and keeping it muddy, uh, and especially if you've been trying these kind of subtle approaches, the more corrective approaches for a couple of years and nothing's happening, it is okay to just hit the reset button, drain that sucker, and start from scratch. And a lot of times it is easier to drain a pond, rebuild it, and restock it than to fix it. Because it's, it's just hard to get a lot of those species out, and it's hard to get a pond back into shape after it's gotten really bad out of whack. Okay, so I wanted to get into muddy water. We're going to run over a little bit, but uh, is it all right if we go five minutes over? You think? Okay. We're going to go five minutes over whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, because uh, this is a really good topic. Uh, it's a really common one in Arkansas, and it's not that difficult to diagnose and figure out what's causing it. There's a really easy test I'll tell you about. So, clearing muddy water, anytime the water stays muddy after a disturbance for a long time, and you'll see it driving down the road in between here and Stuttgart yeah. all the time, you'll see yes. muddy ponds just all over the place. A lot of it's because of poor water hardness, and we talked about water hardness. One of the reasons you would want to clean these ponds up is because fish don't grow well in it. They, most southern sport fish are sight feeding fish. So your largemouth, your bluegills, your red ears, uh, crappie especially, they won't grow very well in muddy water because they can't see what they're trying to eat. Catfish, they don't mind because they feed with their barbels and their sense of smell and taste more than their eyes. So you can get away with muddy ponds if you're stocking catfish. For clearing muddy water, the first step is determining exactly why is it muddy and then treating the source of the problem, not the symptom. That's a big problem with pond issues, especially muddy water, is a lot of times they'll, okay, my pond's muddy, I'll throw in a bunch of uh, agricultural lime, and they'll clear it up for a month, and then it'll get muddy again. Well, what the hell happened? I cleared it up with lime, it should be good. There's something else that's causing the problem. So that would be a case of treating the symptom and not the cause. Here's a test that you can do. If you've got a pond that's muddy, you can be a scientist for a day. And it's real easy. All you need to do is get a, a clear jug of water, go and scoop up a full jug of water, and sit it somewhere for a day, 24 hours, and see what happens. Here's an example of two samples. One has hard water, one has soft water. After 24, 48, uh, a whole week, uh, sitting still. So when we first pick up the water, both of the jars are muddy. If you've got hard water, there's lots of calcium, there's lots of magnesium to stick and bind to those clay particles and sink them out that hard water is going to clear up nice and clean within 24 hours. Ponds with soft water, like around here in Pine Bluff, if there's mud and clay in it, it's going to stay muddy for a long time. And even after a full week, this soft water never cleared up. And you can do that yourself. Just grab a jug, set it somewhere, and see if it clears up. If it clears up, chemistry's not a problem. If it does not clear, chemistry's a problem. Real quick and easy. All right. If the water in your jar clears up, then you've got something else causing muddy water. It could be erosion from wave action. It could be runoff from uh, 
a big deal is like road construction or if you've got ag fields that are laying uh, fallow or they don't have crops on them and they run off quite a bit of mud into the pond. One of the biggest ones is livestock getting into the pond and kicking up the mud at the bank. And then also you could have bottom feeding fish, so the common carps, the bullheads. If, it's, if the water does not clear, then it's a hardness issue. Probably <coughs> you just need to put some kind of a, a hardness substance in there to, to add, your, add to your uh, water hardness. Now there might be a combination of bad chemistry and one of these, but the root of the problem is a lot of times hardness. Some solutions to these issues, so if you've got a shoreline erosion issue, one pretty solution is using riprap rocks. Expensive, hard to get out there, but it is really pretty. And you don't have to do it to the whole pond. A lot of times if you've got erosion, on, erosion issues on the pond, it's on the bank opposite of the predominant wind direction. So you might only have to rock up one corner or maybe one half of the pond, and it looks really pretty and it's really stable, and it also provides habitat for uh, invertebrates and fish and, and stuff to uh, live in it. Also, you could use vegetation. So cattails are a really thick, robust plant that uh, you can plant in these rough areas. Basically, you just have to provide some kind of uh, defense against the erosion while those plants are establishing. So you could use uh, some cages to keep fish, your carp, and uh, other animals from rooting them up, and then you could weight them down with rocks around that little seedling, and it should be able to, to stay there and uh, establish. Muddy runoff coming from the pond, basically just walk around it and see if you see washed out gullies, or if there's a road being built right up the hill. Not a lot you can do about it, but at least you'll know where it's coming from. And uh, one of the biggest things you can do is try to improve vegetation cover around that pond by providing some kind of vegetation or if you've got a, a gully here that's just dumping mud in there every time it rains, you might try to design some kind of a terrace system that makes that water zigzag and go in different directions. Anytime you can slow water down, that will dump sediment out of it. Have you ever uh, driven by overpasses and seen the little water slides going down the side of the overpass and it's got these little concrete zigzags going through it? That's so it slows the water down while it's going down that valley and it doesn't hit the bottom near as much it doesn't, basically it's erosion control for their concrete, but the same effect, uh, the same concept would work for dumping sediment out of water entering a pond. Basically if you slow it down, that'll help drop sediment out of the water and keep the pond cleaner. Livestock are a big deal uh, in Arkansas. Most ponds are built for livestock watering. Uh, now the, the best solution for keeping ponds clean, dealing with livestock, is just don't let them in the pond. There are uh, manuals, uh, fact sheets on how to design external watering features, take some engineering, take some money, but it's best overall for not only the fish but the cows too and the livestock because uh, whenever livestock get into ponds, not only are they making it muddier, but they're defecating in it as well. And a side effect that most folks don't think about, muddy water absorbs heat a heck of a lot better than clear water. So these cows not only are ending up drinking muddy water that's got sediment and poo in it, they're also drinking hotter water, and hotter water also leads to more dangerous algae species. So cyanobacteria really love 95 degree water, and it's really common with muddy ponds to get 95 to 100 degrees, and some of these cyanobacterias, while maybe not high enough concentration to actually kill anything, they could have sublethal effects. So these cows loving in there and cooling off, they're also drinking it. It's actually not good for them, not as good for them if you kept uh, clean water available. If there's absolutely no way to keep the cows out, what you could do is section off a part of the pond, lay down some kind of a geotextile mat that uh, water can move through but mud can't and uh, rocks can't, and then lay down some gravel, pebbles, rocks and stuff on top of that mat and uh, secure it with like two by four frames or something to keep the rocks there. And then make a little fence where the cows can get into the pond but they're always over some kind of a reinforced substrate so they don't kick up the mud the water stays cleaner, the water stays cooler, they get to cool off in the water and they get to drink cooler water. So at best, have an external watering feature, next best is to uh, reinforce the area where they get into the pond. Uh, muddy water causing fish, the bullheads and the common carps, those are just tough to deal with. A lot of times if you've got a whole bunch of these dudes, the, the easiest answer is drain the pond and rebuild it. It's, it's tough to get them out because they're extremely hardy, they're extremely resistant to fish killing chemicals, uh, 
so a lot of times the only 100% sure solution to fix it is to kill them and drain the pond and just start over. All right. And we talked about uh, if chemistry is the issue, applying either agricultural lime, a calcium sulfate, or aluminum sulfate based on the situations of the pond. Okay. Okay, so here are some handy resources that you can download online, uh, available at the Extensions website, but also uh, Southern Regional Aquaculture Center has uh, copies of all these fact sheets as well. You could just Google NRCS 590. There's not a whole lot of files online that are NRCS 590, these exact numbers. So if you Google these uh, publication numbers, a lot of times they're going to come up on the first search, but you can also get them from Southern Regional Aquaculture Center's website and also the Extension websites and go look for fact sheets. Okay? Okay, so there's my contact information. If you have any questions, you can uh, give me a call. And with any Extension activity, if you didn't evaluate and you didn't take pictures, it didn't happen. So I'm going to pass out an evaluation for you so that I can get some scores. <coughs> 